Chapter 1. Franklin Can't Think Like He Used To Dr. Franklin Bryce was nervous about his new patient, Rajal Chirac. The patient seemed friendly enough, even with the orange skin and the bat wings, and in the first few minutes they spent together in Franklin's spacious fourth-story office, Franklin learned that they both had an affinity for American cartoons. That broke the ice a bit, but as Chirac continued to lay more and more of his troubles out in front of him, Franklin felt increasingly ill-equipped to help him. After all, Rajal Chirac was from another dimension called Nixothia, and Nixoths were impervious to telepathy. Several years earlier, Franklin's former patient named Stephen Zarcadmium had surprised him with a gift, the ability to read minds. It was a thank you for helping him get through a suicidal depression. And in doing this, Zarcadmium also introduced Franklin to the existence of alternate dimensions, which changed his life forever. Shortly after that, Franklin was hired on at Vlachter Matt Psychiatric Services, a firm in Abbott City that existed specifically for helping beings from alternate dimensions to cope with life in a new place and for helping human beings to cope with the fact that there really were alternate dimensions. After years of using telepathy in his sessions, Franklin couldn't imagine going without it all the time. He often felt it was the only thing that made him able to keep up with the countless species and cultures he dealt with on a daily basis. Rajal Chirac sat in a big black armchair across from Franklin, who sat in an identical big black armchair. A long glass table separated them. Chirac had two regular human-looking arms and two other appendages connected to his large wings, just like a bat. He looked uncomfortable. The furniture in this dimension must have been quite different from what he was used to. He kept readjusting his wings and shifting his weight from side to side. Tell me more about your wife, Franklin said. I don't even recognize her anymore, Chirac answered. Why is that? She got a body switching operation. Uh, oh, so you literally don't recognize her anymore. But don't get me wrong, I know she's still the same person and everything's still in the right place, but she doesn't have the same things. Her eyes are the wrong color, and her wings are all wrong. How did she come to the decision to get the operation? It's this huge fad in Nixafia right now. You meet someone, you both look at each other's bodies, you each like something the other has, and you make a trade. I think my wife only did it because she wanted to be a little shorter. Shorter? It's considered good luck for women to be really small in Nixafia. Midgets get all the attention. But I think I got the short end of the straw. Well, obviously. Chirac struggled to contain his frustration. Maradosa used to have the most beautiful wings. Do you still love her, Mr. Chirac? Of course I do. I just don't know if I can handle her looking like another woman. Was she acting any differently? No, not really. I mean, she slides under the cat door now, but all short women do that. Give it time. You'll get used to her new appearance. But let her know that it bothers you and that you need time to adjust. Chirac nodded slowly as though he had expected this advice, but knew Franklin was right anyway. Sure, I'll try. Franklin smiled, impressed with himself for getting so far without knowing what Chirac was thinking. Before talking about Chirac's wife, they had already discussed his fear of pine cones, since they didn't exist in his dimension, and they had dug deeply into the psychology behind Chirac's chronic habit of sleeping straight through every single Nixothian holiday. In each case, Franklin managed to give Chirac some semblance of guidance. Before we go, I'd like to go ahead and pay for my first month of sessions, Chirac said, digging frantically through his pockets. The confinement of the armchair made him slap himself repeatedly in the face with his left wing as he moved around. He finally got up out of the chair, reached into his back pocket, pulled out a small white envelope, and handed it to Franklin. I'm afraid I'll forget it if I don't do it now, and then I'll get behind on my bills, and no, that's fine, Franklin said. He and Chirac got up from their armchairs, Chirac thanked him, and they said their goodbyes. Once Chirac had left, Franklin sat behind his small oak corner desk, laced his fingers behind his head, and leaned back to relax. He was finished with his patience for the day, and while he still had a pile of paperwork he wasn't especially looking forward to, he was relieved. He closed his eyes and imagined how the session with Chirac might have gone had Chirac not been a Nixon. 
Franklin would instantly have wowed him with the knowledge that Chirac had a fear of pine cones and was worried that his wife wasn't quite his wife anymore. Chirac would immediately have been put at ease because he had found someone who understood exactly what he was going through, since, after all, Franklin would be able to put all of his problems in exactly the same terms and use exactly the same language Chirac would have. There would have been no probing, no embarrassing questions, no nodding and smiling, pretending he really understood his patient's pain when he was really just trying not to laugh at Chirac's seemingly absurd situation. No matter what the problem was, it never sounded ridiculous when Franklin could actually feel his patients as they talked to him. Franklin felt a small, quick breeze as something brushed past his head. He opened his eyes to see a folded piece of blank white paper floating just above his desk close enough to give him a paper cut if it really felt like it. It slowly unfolded itself, and then the flat paper began to spin around in midair. As it did so, it started to fold itself again and then rip along the front, then along the sides, and then at the back. The top and the sides met, and it became a perfect cube, somehow holding itself together without any tape or glue. I had no idea they made checks that could do that, Franklin thought. And then he instantly felt stupid for thinking it. The cube spun faster and began vibrating violently. As it did, Franklin's head started to throb, first like he was a piece of slate being hit with a chisel, and then with searing pain like the double kick bass in a death metal song. He grabbed both sides of his head and reeled forward until the pain was so unbearable that he fell out of his chair. His head struck the front of his desk. That happened so fast he didn't have time to come up with an analogy for this new kind of pain before he dropped to the floor and blacked out. The last thing he saw before he fell unconscious was the paper cube shooting toward the daylight behind his spacious office windows. His secretary, Bethany, found and woke him a few minutes later. The paper cube was gone and he realized, looking up at her and not feeling anything from her, that either she had finally embraced every blonde stereotype there was and there truly was nothing behind her grapefruit-sized eyes, or the cube had somehow taken his telepathy with it. Bruised and dumbfounded, he was barely able to make a complete sentence. Your mind. The, the, there's, nothing, there's nothing there. Thanks, Bethany said sarcastically. No, I, I mean, I can't read you. Maybe you should buy a thinking aid. Under other circumstances, he might have considered that, but he knew it wouldn't help. As Bethany lifted him off the floor and helped him out of the office and into the hall, his conversation with Rajal Chirac played over in his mind. Chirac had been convincing, but now Franklin recalled noticing something in his eyes, a certain calculation as they talked. He realized that Chirac was analyzing him, looking for clues in case Franklin was on to his scheme. And by the end, when he was sure he had Franklin fooled, Chirac had whipped out his secret weapon and got out of there as fast as he could. He probably didn't have a phobia about pine cones or a wife. Rajal Chirac probably wasn't his real name. He might not have even liked cartoons. Franklin's wife, Lyra, discovered his missing telepathy only three days later when she found an ad for it on interdimensional eBay. It turned out that Chirac was a superpower dealer. He stole people's abilities and sold them for premium prices. Franklin tried to tell the Investigations Division of Interdimensional eBay that Chirac was a thief, but Chirac had somehow forged a legitimate-looking receipt with Franklin's signature saying that Franklin had sold him his telepathy. He must have used some kind of magic forging spell. They were hard to come by, but considering Chirac had managed to convince Franklin that he was a patient in need of counseling, Chirac was obviously a professional with major connections throughout the multiverse. And even if Franklin had been able to prove it, there was no interdimensional law, and alternate dimensions weren't officially recognized in any country in Franklin's dimension. Chirac could only be prosecuted in Nixafia, his own dimension. And from what he knew about the complex and convoluted justice system of Nixafia, Franklin doubted it would be a big priority for them. Franklin sat at his computer and watched the auction, sweating as the price of his telepathy rose and rose. He could feel it slipping further and further away in that final hour as he refreshed his web browser every few minutes and watched the time tick away. The auction had started at a price Franklin couldn't possibly afford, and it ended at an equivalent of $50,000. In that last moment, as he read the words, this auction is now closed, Franklin wondered if this was the first time Chirac had stolen telepathy and if he had ever kept that power for himself. 
He wondered if Chirac was reading his mind before he left, knowing how important the ability was to Franklin's career and his lifestyle. Above all, Franklin wondered if Chirac knew he was ruining his life, and if that information made him reconsider his plans even for a second. The next day, Franklin called in sick for work. <laughs> 